in the periphery, so it's nice to be in the center, to bring things back to the center, the center of my experience. I'm a practicing psychoanalyst, and I have all the work I've been doing has come to me from the clinical practice, things I heard from patients that somehow guide me to more exploration and discovery, and it's, I think, one of the wonderful, fortunate things of, of being a clinician. We, we are taught many interesting things by the people we work with. Um, today, I will share my experience that starts uh, where I, I live and work, which is in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a city that is supposed to be the cradle of the country, the birth of independence, and uh, Always when tourists visit the all area of the city, they are told the story that here is where the Declaration of Independence was signed. And often what tourists are told is that, uh, well, we are over with colonialism. Uh, you know, maybe some features of colonialism were the vagaries of a young republic, but colonialism is over. So people are shown the Liberty Bell and are told to never venture 10 blocks away from the historical area, which is very pretty, independent small over there, where if they were to go to not too far, North Philadelphia Barrio, 20 blocks away, they would then uh, in a quick ride, discover that maybe these seemingly impenetrable zones of late capitalism give us evidence of the lasting effects of America's or the U.S. colonial history, its interventionism in Latin America, and the usual post-colonial effects of this intervention, which is urban diaspora and ghettoization. With my co-editor Chris Christian, we had uh, had the pleasure of bringing not so much psychoanalysis to the barrio, but the barrios back into psychoanalysis. Our inspiration is a long history of a, a commitment, a social conscience that 
Psychoanalysis has had a tradition that was started by Freud himself, the founder of psychoanalysis, and that was followed in many countries in Latin America and was repressed, we may say, using the, the psychoanalytic terminology, lost, forgotten, in North America, north of Rio Grande. It's not the case in Mexico. So we are reclaiming this history. Often psychoanalysis in Latin America is associated with social change, with social commitment, with movements of the left, which is not the case in the US. So what we are trying to do in this collection is to uh, explore um, the experience of psychoanalytic treatments effectively practiced among those who are usually in the American, North American context, considered out of the reach of the unconscious. As I often uh, say this phrase that uh, will maybe sound a little absurd that Often people, when I share my experience of uh, conducting psychoanalysis with poor people of color in the barrio, they seem very surprised. And, and behind that surprise, I think what the, the underlying assumption is that poor people are too poor to afford an unconscious. Oh. Of course, nobody would dare say that. So we try to challenge this assumption. and. Uh, maybe bring back the possibility of psychoanalytic practice in what is considered in the context of the US non, a non-traditional setting. Not far from there, this is uh, the Bloque de Oro in Philadelphia, Fifth Street. And uh, I heard from one of the patients I was working in, in one of the mental health centers where I work in, in North Philly, I heard one patient one morning say to me, ay, andito. Oh, I was so upset. I still upset. I couldn't sleep all night. I spent all night in the caucho. Caucho? I asked myself. Caucho? There it is, the Bloque de Oro. This is, has been painted in yellow to commemorate dreams of getting rich quickly in America. And unhappily, the context is the drab reality of uh, uh, segregation, force in segregation created by this uh, type of social location. Up there, from this uh, image we see, is where I had the clinic. The windows of my office were overlooking the Bloque de Oro. That's where Dolores was sharing with me this story about a couch, which I was I had not worked that long in the barrio, so I wasn't that familiar with couch. Was not in my native Spanish, I thought, okay, could we be rubber from wheels? Not the gaucho from the pampas. No, she was talking about something that for a psychoanalyst was quite important, the couch. In that office, even without a couch, one could nevertheless work productively, and so did Dolores, who related a dream material, uh, used the talking cure to transform and inexplicable physical pains into words that allow her to heal and overcome a trauma that up to that point was almost paralyzing. I may return later to, to Dolores to maybe say a little more about couch. Uh, one experience we have is that whether or not we have an actual couch in the office, as long as we have the will of the psychoanalyst to listen, and to treat the person one is working with, not as an object, but as a subject, then there is the possibility of a productive clinical practice. And this is one of the fortunate elements of the practice, that the couch then becomes like a window through which we could observe social phenomena and could also hear to individual symptoms that at times function like social allegories. It was in the barrio where I discovered not only Spanglish, to go back to caucho for couch, but also I felt very stupid when stupid spelled A E S T U P E D, when I couldn't figure out initially what it meant by what caucho meant. Uh, and I, I think another, besides Spanglish, one can learn is that at times uh, we cannot look at one person in isolation, that in a way, what we call in psychoanalysis the unconscious, is individual and social 
at the same time. And one could not look at individual phenomena without taking into account history. Dolores was one of the many patients I work uh, with in a way the access to her dream life, to her fantasy life, allowed Dolores to regain an agency that she wasn't aware she had and uh, allow also to reposition in the family dynamics. She was suffering from inexplicable back pains that she will refer to in Spanish as saying, I cargo mi cruz, mi cruz, estoy cargando mi cruz. Cruz was also the last name of a stepfather, and she found herself in a complicated family situation. Her mother had passed away recently before she came to see me, and somehow her stepfather was hoping she would replace her mother by becoming his wife. She couldn't cope initially with this situation. The way she could express the conflict was through pain. Eventually, Dolores was able to overcome this psychic pain, put it into work, and position herself and make a choice that was closer to life and, uh, and the possibility of a little bit of freedom, we may say. For many years, based on many cases, Dolores, Socorros, Marias, many Jose's, Felix's, many analysis that taught me that one could work productively with the, the unconscious if there was transference and resistance, if there was the possibility of opening a, a, a place of hospitality to welcome speech, the fundamental rules, say whatever comes to mind, can uh, function independently of context, whether or not there is a couch. I had an office, the, the clinic in better times had been a funeral home. Mm -hmm. um, my office with this very beautiful wooden paneling and a strange, very old carpeting was, I think, one of the rooms where the corpses were brought for viewing. So we could transform this constraint in setting into something where something closer to life, the life of the barrio, could occur. And maybe not so much on the side, as psychoanalysts would say, the death drive of silence. So my experience taught me not only that Freud is not dead, that the tradition that Freud started between the two wars, this goes back to 1918, Freud proposed what he called a psychotherapy for the people. And this was not just a reaction to the horrors of First World War was actually a project that was actualized, and 23 clinics were open all throughout Europe. This tradition was followed also in many countries in Latin America, where even today there are many free clinics. Uh, the model was that uh, psychoanalytic treatment could be ac uh, accessible, like education was free, psychoanalytic treatment could be free as well. Freud was saying that everyone should have the right to have good psychoanalysis as one has the right to get treatment for tuberculosis. That was the comparison he used. And this project took off a little later uh, in the US, not far from here, in Harlem, where another clinic following this model was open in the basement of a church. And that was the Lafarge Clinic that was Name Lafarge to honor the, uh, the philosopher Paul Lafarge, an Afro-Cuban physician, very, of, it was a mixed race Cuban, proudest of his Negro ex extraction, as he said, and also happened to be Karl Marx's son-in-law. And uh, the idea of the founders of the clinic was that psychoanalysis had something very powerful to say to combat the effects of segregation. That was not that it would be the antidote or a palliative effect, but that only a psychoanalytic intervention, pure a psychoanalysis, could be uh, able to tackle the effects of psychic oppression. In that case, was in the treatment of poor African Americans. But that spirit is a little what we claim with uh, our my co-editor, one of our co-authors, Alfredo Carrasquillo, is that a social class, income, a skin color, uh, cannot in be a, um, constructed as a false premise to prevent access to a treatment that I don't propose. Psychoanalysis should be the only ac treatment made accessible in the barriers. But what I find suspicious is that 
it is excluded, that is not made accessible. And there we have a situation of exclusion, segregation. And, uh, and in my clinical experience, as both a psychotherapist and a clinical director, had taught me that one could work very productively from a psychoanalytic perspective uh, with patients of the barrio. There, I learned many things. Another one I discovered was something called the Puerto Rican syndrome that led me to then uh, write a book condensing my experience as a psychoanalyst working in a mental health center. With this strange label, Puerto Rican syndrome, I had patients come into the clinic presenting what many of you may recognize as symbols of attack de nervios. They were uh, supposedly, from the medical perspective, inexplicable syndromes, attacks of anger, uh, something that could look almost like an epileptic attack, but there was no organic correlate, was not epilepsy, at times hallucinations, suicidal gestures, loss of memory. Uh, what in uh, the cultural context, and one of the, the documents I found doing research on the Puerto Rican syndrome was that if somebody has an attack and is seen here in the Upper East Side in New York, it's a very dangerous medical emergency. Whereas if it happens in context where the culture, or maybe in the island, somebody brings a little fun, a little alcoholado, and maybe it's expectable in situations of distress. So we see, or what I took as a, an interesting symptom is that there is a label called the Puerto Rican syndrome. We don't have American anxiety in the Bible of psychiatric diagnosis. We don't have American anxiety. We don't have French melancholy or Argentinian narcissism. But we have, <laughs> we have Puerto Rican syndrome for a population that is not an independent nation, is not recognized as such, at least that gets to be given a national label for a quote-unquote disease. The name forces us to think politically. We cannot look at the Puerto Rican syndrome without seeing something clinical, social, political at the same time. And so then we may say that every single patient coming to the clinic experiencing a Puerto Rican syndrome or an attack of the nervous is at the same time presenting an allegory of a social situation that we need to look at as well. So we have this nationality, cultural phenomenon, and mental illness all together. What I would like to share with you rapidly, in the interest of time, is uh, something I, I discovered when I was working on the Spanish version of the Puerto Rican uh, uh, syndrome, thanks to the work of Silvia Alvarez Curvelo. I discovered, to my great surprise, that when the label, there's not that, it's a diagnosis that is relatively new, was invented in 1952, and it was diagnosed by Anglo doctors in a Korean War veterans that were coming from the Korean War and having these uh, pseudo seizures or explosion of anger, amnesia. They were having attacks. And the Anglo doctors could not see anything, even in the description, in all the, the bibliography, the only common feature is that it happened to Puerto Ricans. Therefore, they say Puerto Rican syndrome. Exposing the racism of a, of a psychiatric practice when otherness is immediately rendered pathological. And also, maybe is functioning as a metaphor for a very complex political situation that was happening precisely in 1952. What I discovered uh, with the, this recent research that was not yet done at the time I wrote that book, that book was uh, published in 2003. I, I had the opportunity of revisiting this uh, 10 years later. Uh, we have an interesting incident that maybe many of you know, the story of the Borinqueniers. I will not go into the details. I do that in the collection, if you want to take a look at what is my reading of this. But rapidly, now what I would like to share with you for, for our discussion is that the events uh, I would refer to is, first of all, the position that Puerto Rican soldiers occupy fighting for the United States. And this is 
uh, summarized and very well analyzed by uh, Silvia Alvarez Cuberrello, who observes how the colonial power makes a shift from treating the colonial other, the, the subaltern, as a lower soldier, supposedly weak, coward, not uh, deserving of an important position. And this led somehow to uh, an exceptional uh, situation because the Borinqueneers were the only segregated section of the military after segregation had been outlawed. In 1948, Truman outlawed segregation, but still this remains segregated. So it's a return of the repress, we may say using psychoanalytic terminology, or it's a continuation of a, a policy of exception that is permitted in colonial situations. What uh, we see uh, uh, happening, and is very well documented in, in, in different works by several historians who have explored this situation, is that we have a, a Puerto Rican uh, soldier caught between contradictory discourses. On the one hand, uh, Luis Munoz Marin asking from the island to show the pride of Puerto Ricans. They were allowed to unfurl the Puerto Rican uh, flag in, uh, in different places they were conquering. The Borinqueneers displayed um, um, incredible amount of uh, courage and were very victorious initially. And at the same time, they were still considered a lower uh, other and not allowed to be fully enfranchised in, in somehow in an in-between position. Uh, what I think is, is interesting is that there were a series of events that precipitated something that I cannot help but put in parallel. I would refer very rapidly to uh, two events that you may be familiar with, for those who, who know what happened during the Korean War. One um, event was that in 51, the skillful commander, Colonel William Harris, was released from his duties, and they called to replace him a Puerto Rican, which again shows the contradiction. Why did they need to uh, have at the head of this group a Puerto Rican? I think it exhibits the contradictions of the. Hello? It's working? No. Maybe my voice can carry me. Working great. So the, the Borinqueneers are the orders of the commander uh, Cordero, conquer the Hill of Kelly as a sort of blood offering to the empire to show how committed this group were how loyal Puerto Ricans were to the United States. That was a tribute of blood, but was also a bloodbath with one of the most, uh, the highest uh, losses of human lives during the Korean War. Uh, Cordero was immediately replaced after, and this is the moment where I think something of the symptomatic situation that could maybe lead to uh, political revolt or maybe some sort of hysterical manifestation. I read the Puerto Rican syndrome as a form of hysteria. It happens to be one of the things I discovered to my surprise when I work in North Philadelphia is that the Puerto Rican syndrome happens to be an exact repetition of the most classical form of hysteria, the one with which Freud not only discovers invented psychoanalysis, but discovered the existence of the unconscious. And one claim we could make that one cannot think of the unconscious without thinking that it is also political, that it is individual and social at the same time. One cannot look closely to the unconscious without seeing social elements at play. And maybe this is how I see uh, this historical event that when Cordero was replaced, they put in charge at Chester the Grave, who was an American from Wisconsin, who had horrible content for the 
Puerto Rican soldiers and wanted to impose an Americanization change in the diet from beans and rice to hot dogs and potatoes. And there was an important moment when he, uh, in punishment, he found them not wearing the usual uniform. They have grown beards and forced them to shave not just the beard, but the mustache, until they would prove that they were men again. And this was a very insulting gesture, because it was a humiliation to their uh, identity, their sense of masculinity. And uh, this was many refused, and under the threat of court martial, they eventually gave up to the command. There was a, an incident that took place, and I will not go into detail, that was a moment of rebellion in Jackson Heights. And you may know the details. We could maybe discuss it. But I think it's important that then there was an irrationality from the power. And there was a rebellion from the soldiers in a moment where that irrationality, that contradiction, could not be tolerated anymore. And of 200 soldiers uh, arrested, 91 were tried. They were found guilty. And all this work was kept very quiet in the island until much later on. Oh, I will stop here. Just I want to mention this thing. It was very surprising for me, and this is why I wanted to share it with you, because I found this as a and this is eventually, there was a revisiting of history. This is the gold medal awarded by Obama in 2014. Uh, this is an older picture. And, and then there is a, a document, a monument. This is in Rio Piedras. Mm -hmm. you, you may know it. What I want to see is that when we have a social context, when there is no expression for political mm, dissidence, at times, and this has been my experience working in the barrio, the whole body could become a wars and speak through pain, suffering, and at times through paralysis. That we could read at times individual symptoms as willing to speak, and they could be heard in if one is allowing oneself to give them a space for speech. That at times, in the face of uh, irrationality, one needs to affirm one's identity, even at the expense of maybe some troublesome expressions. Um, today, So, to conclude, today when somebody in the barrio presents with symptoms of an attack de nervios, an Anglo doctor may still think of the Puerto Rican syndrome and consider it a medical severe situation, an emergency. But if this uh, practitioner would maybe be open to maybe think of an attack or not think of anything. I think the wonderful way to intervene in these cases is a position of ignorance of when we let the patient where the knowledge is teach us and guide us and let them speak and hear themselves speak and regain that knowledge and that power that is often denied given the social position they are ascribed. Today, if somebody then would have an attack in a different context, could be considered maybe normal. Maybe we could treat it with some agua florida, alcoholado, or holy water. sorry, holy water, or maybe look at the outside history that could be an element of overdetermination. To conclude, my experience in the barrio as a clinician have taught me that even without a caucho, psychoanalytic treatments can be brief and successful. Perhaps because listening to the unconscious means, above all, taking an ethical stand, simply treating the other as a subject, not as an object. Uh, language shapes our behaviors. Words can hurt, but the right word, a spoken at the right time, can cure. No wonder that couch in English also means to say or express something, to put an idea into words. 
perhaps Dolores' use of the word caucho could also call up the horrible colonial history of exploitation of rubber in Brazil and the horrible way the native population was treated during the Amazon rubber boom. Maybe Dolores Caucho's story of insomnia, pain, loss, betrayal, and incestuous wishes was perhaps also unwittingly reproducing a forgotten truth, retelling something that needed to be said. So I think it's important to maybe treat symptoms not just as afflictions, but also as messages that speak to desire, to conflict, to inhibitions, to social political conflict, to trauma that could be shaped by past events, could be the effects of history, or that in most cases still remains unconscious. The transformation that psychoanalysis grants is achieved by interweaving past, present, opening the possibility of a future. So I maybe would like to, to conclude with mm, mm, a call to try to uh, think that perhaps, given the recent historical events, one continues here of them in, in the practice today, the most recent social trauma shared by many uh, analysis today would be the ravages of Hurricane Maria. And, and I think that maybe when we look at, at, the, at the reality of uh, Maria ravaging Puerto Rico, flattening homes, flooding streets, decimating power grids, destroying cell phone towers, uh, leaving the island in the brink of collapse, we maybe uh, see that moment as perhaps being a moment where a certain truth can no longer be concealed after the spectacular failure of the US federal response, the incompetence of the relief efforts uh, during this humanitarian crisis. All this has exposed a long history of neglect. A terrible indifference of the main line perhaps has destroyed the fiction of America as a paternalistic colonial power. And maybe we could say that the catastrophe swept away not only many lives, many illusions, but perhaps left the future open and maybe dispel all and sad dreams, stale dreams, and perhaps it's about time to forge new dreams. And one thing Freud says always is that dreams are the royal path to the unconscious. So maybe making the unconscious be productive is the possibility of opening up new possibilities for realization of dreams. Thank you. Sure. He was educated in Spain, Puerto Rico, Mexico, and the United States and Quebec. He serves as full professor of graduate studies at the Universidad de Sagrado Corazón, University of the Sacred Heart, and contributes to the formation of new analysts and the transmission of psychoanalysis at the Sociedad Psicoanalítica de Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico Psychoanalytic Society. He has co-authored seven books published in Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Spain, and Quebec. He was the founder and first responsible for the circle of Puerto Rico of the Freudian School of Quebec, and I will not try and pronounce that. <laughs> and, he, and we are very pleased that he has a chapter in, uh, in the book Psychoanalysis in the Vargas. I want to express my gratitude for the invitation to be here at the Centro. Uh, second, uh, say thanks both to Chris and to Patricia for having given me the opportunity to, to be part of the authors of this uh, anthology. And there are three things I, I want to share if I do have the time uh, this afternoon, this evening. First, uh, to share with you my, my take on what's the value proposition of this book, uh, what it, it offers. Second, to say something about what my, my chapter uh, talks about or, or, or addresses as part of the psychoanalysis in the barrios. And of course, being at the centro, and having arrived from Puerto Rico this morning, uh, it's important perhaps to uh, share some of my thoughts uh, about how psychoanalysis allows us to think about the current situation of Puerto Rico. Uh, first, uh, I have to say that 
the, in terms of psychoanalysis in the barrios of this book, the importance I, I, I recognize in the different contributions of my, of my co-authors has to do with an expression that perhaps all of us heard from a Puerto Rican mother or a Puerto Rican father at some point, or maybe from other Latin American and Caribbean countries. Usted habla cuando las gallinas mean. In most clinical practices today, the problem is that patients are not allowed to speak. Hmm? Uh, there is an etymological origin of the word infants, infantilization, or infantile. And my perspective is that current and hegemonic practices, both in psychiatry and in psychology, tend to destitute people from the position of subjects responsible of their lives and turning them into objects of medical intervention, interventions that actually do not allow people to have a say about what they are suffering. The, the, the problem after Hurricane Maria, but actually before Maria as well, was that people go to psychiatrists and before they start speaking, speaking the, the psychiatrist is already making the prescription. Huh? And uh, probably no more than five minutes that person is out with the new pills and, and the chemical straitjacket that will keep them uh, uh, suffering and not, not actually finding solutions. So the value proposition that I recognize in this book is that it is telling us that psychoanalysis is not only a clinical practice, but it is also an ethical and a political stance in front of that perspective. What we as psychoanalysts say is that there is a need for all citizens, be it in barrios or in high-end contexts, to have the opportunity to have a say about their suffering, about their lives, and be able to work through whatever is needed uh, in, the, in their lives. And that right to have a say, that right to, to express what is important in their lives in a clinical context, for instance, is not only a right for those who can afford it, but that we have a human right to create the conditions for everyone, or everyone has a human right to have a space for uh, no matter their financial situation, their uh, uh, ethnic background, uh, to, to have that, that uh, opportunity. And, and my, my chapter in the book has to do with uh, an experience in Quebec City that I have been working with for, for many years now that actually addresses the access of psychoanalysis to the poor among the poor, uh, which is psychotics. Uh? And that has a key distinction between, uh, there is a key distinction between how psychiatry and psychology address psychosis and how in psychoanalysis we have come to understand uh, psychosis. And I pull it, pull it, will pull, put it very bluntly. Psychosis is not a disease. It is not an illness. It is a way, a different way of being a human being. It is a psychic structure. And instead of destituting psychotics from the position of subjects, instead of destituting them from being citizens, clinicians have to be allies of the possibility of psychotics finding a way in the social link to have a space to belong and to act as citizens responsible for themselves and for others, with others. Mm -hmm. huh? And what I share in the, in the chapter is uh, the, the, the experience of a center that for more than 30 years in Quebec City has actually been uh, doing that and developing a particular psychoanalytic uh, perspective on uh, how this could go about. But why is it that psychiatry and psychology and most hegemonic practices, clinical practices, prefer to consider psychosis uh, uh, an illness and something that is organic and it has to do with what, how people have their brains wired and it's a problem that comes from the fabric and there's nothing we can do? 
Well, I have a very particular take on it that I share in the chapter, and it is that clinicians are simply afraid of psychosis. Huh? They are afraid to listen to psychotics, not only because the psychotic is someone who's different, it's not only a fear of otherness, huh? but it is also a fear of what in psychoanalysis we call something of the real that is coming out in the discourse of this, in the experience of the psychotic, that the clinician is afraid not only of what he's listening and watching in the experience of the other, but it somehow evokes his or her own experiences, and he wants to know nothing about that. Jacqueline Miller talks about the concept, actually Lacan talks about the concept of extimite, something which seems to be outside of ourselves, but it's incredibly intimate, and it's part of our own experience, but we try. It's better to place it in the experience of the other uh, and not having anything to do or anything to say about that. I think that that connects to a cultural and political problem that we have in this country and across uh, the world, namely the, the problem of, of, of the different types of phobias. Huh? And uh, there is a philosopher in Spain that put up, uh, put a, wrote a book uh, last year or three years ago, Adela Cortina, uh, who says that we might be getting confused about the fact that the problem today is xenophobia, or that Trump's issue is xenophobia. And she says no. And she uh, creates the concept, uh, building on the etymological origin of two concepts, uh, the concept of aporophobia. Mm? And she says that the problem today, and the biggest phobia today, is fear of the of poor people, being fearful about those who are poor. Huh? And he creates and develops this whole idea of about aporophobia. And, that, and she says, well, Trump is not, I mean, Trump has a, I mean, his wife and other people are, are foreigners. The issue is not dealing with foreigners. That's not the problem. It's poor people who uh, happen to be foreigners as well, where the, where the, where the problem, where the problem uh, is. And, Part of the situation that we see in this country today has to do with the fact of excluding Hispanics or trying to erase or uh, make Hispanics invisible. And that implies not having the opportunity for Hispanics to have a say, to have a voice, just as in the clinical context, in a, in a political context. So there is something uh, Trump and many others fear about our otherness, huh? fear, in my perspective, and that's what I share in that, in that chapter, is central to the understanding of otherness in the case of psychotic as well, uh, psychosis as well. But fear is central to the experience of Puerto Rico. Huh? Uh, you cannot understand the political situation of Puerto Rico, its current trap in terms of its uh, political situation, colonial situation, if you do not understand uh, the, the, the issue of fear. For example, Patricia was just sharing the experience and, and the, the, the understanding of the Puerto Rican syndrome among uh, Puerto Rican soldiers and in Puerto Rican communities. That has to do with that fear of, of otherness. But also, in Puerto Rico, fear is present in and informs so many of the political positions that people take uh, in our country in, 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 different, in different ways. So I, I would love to end sharing with you uh, some reflections about how I see this issue of, of, of fear and, and other issues that, from a psychoanalytical perspective, a psychoanalytic perspective, we can think and allow us to understand or say some things about uh, the current Puerto Rican situation. Reynardo Ortiz from Brooklyn College, who's here, invited me a couple of months after Hurricane Maria, in just in the aftermath, to, to begin this reflection later on with the Asociación de Psicología de Puerto Rico and, and the school, the doctoral program of public health in Puerto Rico. We kept working on this, on this concept, and, and I ended identifying what I call four cultural traps. Huh? four cultural traps that I think that from a psychoanalytic perspective we can identify, 
and invite people to think in order to find an ethical, ethical and political way out of the current situation of, of Puerto Rico. What's the first of those four traps? The first trap I would propose is what I call the trap of the bridging of the divine providence. I don't know how many of you know that the patron of uh, Puerto Rico, the Catholic patron of Puerto Rico, is the virgin of the divine providence. For example, there is another important virgin, is uh, Lady of Montserrat in, in Oroco, in Hormigueros, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it was not the Virgen de la Montserrat. It ended up being La Virgen de la Providencia. But think for a minute about that. What does it mean for a colonial country to have as a patron a virgin that represents providing its sons and, its, and daughters something? To what extent, even if we are not Catholic, culturally, what does it mean for a country, for a colony, to have a structure in which we are all sons and daughters of someone who provides for us. We do not have to provide for ourselves if there is someone who will uh, provide uh, for us. It places us in the position of a kid, uh, asking for the protection and expecting someone else to take charge, charge and create a solution for us. Many, many of our grandmas and grandpas would say when we were kids, oh, don't worry, Dios proveerá. Uh, God will provide, hmm? Trump will provide, FEMA will provide, uh, Americans will not leave us alone. First trap. Second trap, a trap that I was able to, to, to discuss many, many years ago with Patricia in, in a previous work together, what I call the trap of the fantasy of permanent union. Hmm? In the 1950s, Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Rican politicians were trapped in the discussion of what of the political status options of Puerto Rico would guarantee our permanent union with the United States. Because the idea is that the future of Puerto Rico, uh, the, 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 the safety for Puerto Ricans was if we were able to make sure that we would be permanently united to the uh, uh, US. Huh? This idea became somehow the nodal point of our political space. And you would get pro-statehooders saying the only thing that grants uh, permanent union is becoming a state. Uh, Pro-autonomy leaders saying, no, no, uh, we also, with the Estado Libre Asociado, uh, can be permanently united, and, and that becomes the political field of, of discussion. That's a second, a second trap. The third trap is what I call the stealing of the presence in relation to a future promise. The idea that nowadays, with the Fiscal Control Board in Puerto Rico, accept all the austerity measures, take and do your sacrifices, that will create later on the promise of an economic stability, and we'll get there. The promise of independence, the promise of statehood, do things today, accept sacrifices today, and at some point we will be in a better position. Let's not forget that when General Miles uh, landed in Puerto Rico and invaded Puerto Rico, his declaration after the invasion in 1898 was saying, uh, we are here to bring you the blessings of American democracy. But given that you are still not fit for democracy, we are going to establish a military government until you are educated to become good American citizens. And you'll study uh, Puerto Rico civics. And once you are fit for democracy, you will have the, ha the chance to have elections and so on. That took us almost uh, 40, 40 years. So not only. Miles made a promise in 1898. The law that creates the Fiscal Control Board is called PROMESA. Hmm? Fourth trap, the logic of complaint or the enjoyment of complaint, el goce de la queja, o la lógica de la queja. Of course, no one complains about him or herself. We always complain about someone else. Huh? 
And the logic of, of la queja, of complaining, not only shows that when you complain, you're placed in a position of victim of someone else who's not allowing you to do or to be or to whatever, but you are expecting that there will be a savior who will rescue you, who will take you out of that situation. And the, the issue of complaining, uh, that first trap, is that you're not in a position of political agency when you're placed in a position of victim. Huh? So how we move away from that position. So the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and the, what has been happening in Puerto Rico during the last couple of years, I think, faces us with some ethical challenges. And I remember here what Ralph Waldo Emerson said once, which is everything looks permanent until its secret is known. Hmm? And what Patricia was saying uh, recently here is that there are moments, junctures, historical junctures in which truth can no longer be hidden. Hmm? I think Hurricane Maria not only uncovered truths regarding the level of poverty in Puerto Rico, but also truths regarding our real political situation. Yeah, the patron is still the virgin of the divine providence, but Americans are not there to provide. Actually, we were expecting Trump to provide, and he came to throw us paper towels. Huh? That's what we got. Hmm? So somehow it's showing, it's uh, demystifying uh, an understanding that is no longer uh, working. Thank you. Second, second uh, understanding or truth that is somehow revealed uh, is that why complain if the imperial order is really there not listening? We have a colleague who's a psychoanalyst in Mexico City that who used to share a joke about this guy who enters into a church and sees the light of the confessionary on, gets into the confessionary, kneels down, and says, Father, forgive me because I have sinned. Last night, I entertained myself three times. And from the other side of the confessionary, a voice comes and said, well, you can cut it off uh, 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 because I'm here painting. Mm? <laughs> That is to say, I'm not a priest, and I give a damn about your sins. Hmm? The worst thing for someone is complaining or expecting someone from another and seeing or facing the reality that the other is not interested in you. Hmm? That's an in important trap to understand after Maria, even pro-statehooders know, even if they are in denial, they know that the imperial order, that Americans give a damn about Puerto Rico, and there is no longer, and we actually have, paradoxically, to be thankful to Trump for that, there is not even lip service anymore huh? about, about that uh, uh, situation. So, I'll, I'll end by saying that uh, not only psychoanalysts have a, we have a responsibility, an ethical, a political responsibility to be part of the political and social conversation about these issues and bringing this type of per perspective that uh, I've been sharing with you uh, tonight. But I think also that we have to remember what Eric, Eric Loran, a psychoanalyst, a French psychoanalyst used to say, people like Hispanics, Puerto Ricans, psychotics, we might be excluded from economic relations, but we are not excluded from language. Hmm? We have the opportunity to speak. And as psychoanalysts, and I think that's what psychoanalysis in the barrios is about, as psychoanalysts, we have to place ourselves in an ethical position of allowing people to have the opportunity to speak. Because as Eric Laurent says, if we have the opportunity to speak, we have the opportunity to produce solutions. Huh? And if we have the opportunity to produce solutions, we will no longer be complaining 
or waiting for someone else to do things for us, we'll take charge for the first time, perhaps, of our own future and of our country. Thank you. So we have time for questions and uh, hopefully answers. And I'll pass the microphone if anyone is interested in asking a question. Yes, my name is Charles Ortiz. I wanted to ask uh, uh, both of you, how is it that someone that uh, is living in the projects and um, perhaps is working a job at a McDonald's uh, and uh, just paying bills if they can, probably sharing bills with other brothers and sisters or with a mother, father's not even there, even come close to thinking about conditions and issues that have to do with their own identity, uh, their emotional problems or psychological problems. Uh, <laughs> now I sat throughout this whole thing. You're very accomplished people. I, I, I have to give you that. And I, I, I can really see, uh, in some ways, the um, benefits of uh, your studies. But the preponderance of <laughs> of uh, poor people, whether they happen to be Puerto Rican or black or Irish or Jewish or Italian. And by those two last groups I'm talking about 100 years ago, how could they even begin to think about psychoanalysis when they're just busy trying to get by? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm going to pass the microphone back to the gentleman in a second, but a person like that is just thinking about day-to-day -day things. Uh, and yeah. psychoanalysis, uh, or even the, uh, the hope that they could try to go to you or go to an office, is, um, it's like down the, down the line in terms of importance. Th thank you for your comment. I, I agree with you that uh, somebody who is in a very difficult situation uh, may need help with other means that may have to do. I think we are putting an emphasis on history. One thing we want to challenge is the idea that poor people are different, are essentially different. Poverty is historically constructed, can change. People happen to find themselves in a social condition of poverty. And they may need to deal with concrete, urgent issues. That doesn't prevent them from suffering. In fact, precisely because they are in such difficult conditions. They may suffer, and uh, in, uh, I will talk only for myself, I happen to have the opportunity of making a living, being hired by a clinic in the barrio, and my job was to be there to listen to people. And I had the limited freedom to choose while I was sitting in that office for that, with that person for an hour that we had to share. I could have played the master and reproduce the same social conditions that put that person in a position of poverty and tell that person what to do. How could, dare I, say to someone who probably if, was managing to survive in such difficult conditions, had a better know-how than myself about how to survive uh, having children, maybe being on unemployment, maybe three generations of unemployment. But I had the possibility of intervening and give that person a different type of interaction where I would treat that person as a person. In most mental health centers, people who come for help are treated as, uh, Alfredo said, as children, infantilized. Infants means etymologically without speech. They are not allowed to say what they have to say. And what the magic of psychoanalysis is that when you speak to an analyst, you hear yourself differently. It's like when you have a cell phone with bad reception, times you hear your voice coming back, and it's a little uncanny. But in the setting is where you give the possibility of someone to give themselves an authority that probably nowhere else in society they are given. And 
I, I can relate to, to your, your concerns. And I think our, our last presentation at NYU, we ended up with a political platform. I think that certain things need to be addressed by other means that are not clinical. But in the clinical encounter, you could have an intervention that does not stop being political. And you could choose being on the side of the master or treating the other person as a subject. I don't know if there you are, that. Sure. Uh, two things. One, uh, nonprofit organizations, civil society organizations, community-based organizations, usually create spaces for people who are living very precarious lives uh, to get support, for example, usually from social workers and people in the community to help them with the basic needs. What has been happening in some communities, and I have had the privilege of working with some of those organizations since 1995, has been that aside from allowing people to have access to a social worker or a community organizer or someone who will help with their uh, material conditions, that there might be a clinician, a psychoanalyst or a psychologist or someone who would be available for that person to process whatever that person is living. And my experience in those contexts is that people, when they have the access to that, they use it. Huh? They might be very busy surviving, but instead of having the time to go and get drunk to the local bar, they, go for, they come for an hour or 45 minutes and try to work through some of the things and, and allow, that allows them to place themselves in a different position. They will not pay for that service. Uh, we will establish a symbolic payment which creates the condition for a commitment of that person to that work. Uh, the organization will uh, get the funding for that. And, and, and that has been happening in many contexts in Puerto Rico and has been very important for uh, people living in very difficult situations. The second thing that I, I would like to answer is what happened after, just after Maria. Uh, we had many people in shelters during uh, the, the actual hurricane and then hours after they went home to check their houses. And then hours later, they came back to the shelter because they had no home. Uh, it was destroyed or it had no roof. And they had to come back to the shelters. What many psychoanalysts did and, and brought in uh, psychiatrists and people, uh, we put together a group of volunteers to work in different shelters with kids and with adults. And later on, we brought in uh, theater groups uh, to create the conditions, not, not for psychoanalysis, but to create spaces for people to speak, to draw, to paint, to use theater techniques, to express and process the trauma of the hurricane and the trauma of having gone back to their homes and not having a home. Huh? Uh, that is the if the conditions are created for that to be accessible, people use it, and it could be a life transforming experience. Yeah, it's, it's an American adaptation. It was an invention. Psychoanalysts in the US wanted to make as much money as plastic surgeons. You cannot do Botox five times a week, but you could do psychoanalysis five times a week. So many physicians went into the practice of psychoanalysis, and specifically in the US. It's a particular development of US psychoanalysis, which is not the case in other geopolitical situations. Freud himself, we may say, wrote in 1913, if I'm not misquoting, he apologized, say psychoanalysis lasts too long. Six months, very difficult cases, one year. So 
What are we calling psychoanalysis today is an American deviation that has to do with market interest and not clinical conditions. Because maybe it could be a case that someone needs long treatment during their lifetime, but not everyone. And <laughs>